is itself. Um, but the one thing we notice beyond all the cars with American flags and cabs with American flags is uh, there was far less horn honking today. People seem a little bit calmer in it all than New Yorkers sometimes get. Uh, horns constantly going off in the city. Uh, but today, at least as I was coming in, it, it seemed people were a little more patient. Maybe it was my imagination and wishful thinking. Maybe it is in fact true, but that's how it seemed. Elizabeth Cohen has been, for the last several days, as many of you know, uh, at the armory here in New York where the missing have come. It, it's actually, Elizabeth, when we talked last night, I think we both had a sense that the mood there had shifted quite significantly from, particularly from Thursday to Friday. Where are you today? Well, today, the people that I'm talking to, Aaron, still have hope. We're actually going to speak with a woman who is looking for her brother, and she says she still has hope. But we are hearing more people say that it is getting harder to maintain that hope. We talked, actually, with an American Red Cross worker a little while ago who said, you know what, on Wednesday, people didn't really want counseling. They just wanted to go out into the hospitals and look. Today, more people are saying, you know what, I need to sit down and talk. I need counseling. Some 3,000 people have been to the armory here to register information about their missing relatives. And today, for the first time, they've offered DNA testing. That means that they scrape the inside of the cheek of a close relative to the person who's missing so that that DNA can then be cross-matched later on. Um, I want to introduce you to a woman of, of great strength, Miri Ortali Malitas, um, who is looking for her brother, um, Peter Ortali. Um, tell me, Mary, when was the last time someone heard from your brother? Um, he was... After the first plane crashed into the, the World Trade Center, he called my mother you know, and said, you know, a plane just crashed, turn on the news. Um, after that, he called his wife, and then I believe he received a phone call from a friend in California, also with the news of a plane crash. Um, and then that's the last anyone's ever heard from him. And then apparently just from bits and pieces from people in, um, who work with him on the floor, you know, the evacuate the building um, announcement came on. Everyone was leaving the floor. The last person leaving said no one was left on the floor. Um, and, you know, we, haven't, we just haven't heard anything. Um, he did appear on the survivorlist.com um, and also on a nyc.com list. Um, a different phonetic spelling, but, you know, it's, it just seemed too kind of ironic not to be him. And then there was a... Um, he, the name on the survivor list, that list went down, and then the other list actually went off the, the, you know, is not on the Internet again today. So, you know, the Red Cross had said as soon as we heard it that there was really, they couldn't, there's no validity to it. All they can go by is what the hospitals are actually giving them. So, you know, we kind of, our family has been back and forth. Uh, people came up on Tuesday to go to the hospitals and do some of the searching. They left yesterday. We came up yesterday and kind of doing the same thing. Um, going back to all the hospitals, putting up more pictures. I mean, just in the hope that, you know, if you took the stairwell with him, if he was if he was next to you, did you see him? Was he helping somebody? You know, him and um, one of his good friends, Dennis McHugh, his boss, Eddie Martovich. I mean, these are people, you know, that we used to see all the time. And now it seems kind of surreal that I'm, you know, hanging up missing posters with my brother all over New York City. It's, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's, but we do. We still have hope. You know, I ran into a lot of, um, I ran into two doctors last night who said you have to continue to have hope. You know, they're, they're getting through all that stuff, you know, every minute, every hour down there, you know, and telling how hard all the people are working down there. So, I mean, we're hopeful. We, we still are. We really are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mary. Thank you so much. Mary, who is one of the thousands who is looking for lost relatives here, looking at the armory on the corner of 26th and Lexington. Aaron? I, I, uh, I, when people talk of their hope, it's, it's very moving. I wonder if, in, at times like this, if th there's a terrible, I don't mean this to sound cold, there is a terrible uh, sense of helplessness here. Uh, someone you love a lot is gone. You need to go someplace, do something to shake yourself of the helplessness. And I wonder if some people are coming down just to be with others who are in their situation. 
Well, you know, it's interesting because the counselor who we talked to earlier said a woman who was looking for her husband said, I'm here because if I go home, I will feel as if I have given up on looking for my husband. But I think it is more than just wanting company. There was a gentleman we talked to who was looking for his brother, Pablo Ortiz. He saw on a list that an Ortiz was listed as being at a hospital way up on the Upper West Side, and he ran, got in the cab, went and looked, and it was the wrong Ortiz. So there are some leads that people are trying to follow. Elizabeth, thank you. Elizabeth Cohen at the Armory to Washington. Judy. We are, we are told that there's a new development with regard to the president. Uh, for that, let's go near Camp David to CNN's White House correspondent, Kelly Wallace. Kelly? You know, all day we've been talking about how Mr. Bush has really sort of stepped up his language. For the first time, he is now saying that the U.S. is at war and that he is not going to be satisfied with just a token response, but with what he calls a sweeping and effective campaign. Mr. Bush also saying that uh, terrorists may hide out in holes, but that the U.S. would go ahead and smoke them out. Well, we asked Ori Fleischer if the president was laying the groundwork and preparing for the American people for the possibility that the U.S. could use ground troops to try and take care of those terrorists responsible, deemed responsible for these attacks. And Ari Fleischer, Fleischer saying nothing has been ruled out. Now, Mr. Bush talking to reporters earlier today before a meeting with his national security team, included in that meeting, of course, Vice President Cheney, as well as his top national security advisors. And before he, uh, that meeting got underway, Mr. Bush using some of the same words his father used when he announced the uh, backing for the Persian Gulf War 10 years ago. Mr. Bush saying that this act will not stand. There's no question about it. This act will not stand. We will find those who did it. We will smoke them out of their holes. We will get them running. And we'll bring them to justice. We will not only deal with the, those who dare attack America, we will, de we will deal with those who harbor them and feed them and house them. Make no mistake about it. Underneath our, underneath our tears is the strong determination of America to win this war. And we will win it. One other thing that President Bush did today, for the very first time, he named suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden as a, quote, prime suspect. He also said that if bin Laden thinks that he can keep away and hide out from the U.S. and its allies, he was, quote, sorely mistaken. Now, Judy, as you know, U.S. officials not talking about any military options that this administration will be considering, but we do know the president spending the weekend at the presidential retreat at Camp David, meeting with his national security team, discussing a range of options, political, economic, and, of course, military options, again, to deal with what he calls a sweeping and effective campaign against terrorism. Judy? All right, Kelly Wallace uh, reporting near Camp David. The president today saying this will be a different kind of conflict against a different kind of enemy. Joining me now, Peter Bergen, who is writing a book on Osama bin Laden. Peter, I just want to cite something else the president said today. He said it's, it's, a, not, it's a conflict without battlefields or beachheads, a conflict with opponents who believe they are invisible, and yet they are mistaken. Uh, do they believe they're invisible, Peter? Well, they're certainly in a country that they know intimately well and the United States knows very little about. The United States closed its embassy in Afghanistan in 1989. We don't have any information uh, on the ground uh, about the situation there, really. We have to rely on other uh, people like the Pakistanis for information. So if you're, gonna, if you're considering a ground campaign in Afghanistan, you're going into, one of, A, one of the most inhospitable places in the world, B, a place bin Laden knows intimately well because he's been there on and off since 1986, and C, a place we have very little information about. Let me ask you about the neighboring country of Pakistan. As, as you know, the president, the administration has laid down, a, thrown down the gauntlet, in effect, to Pakistan and other countries, saying you're either with us or you're against us. Here are specific things we want you to do, and you're either on our side or you're not. 
My question to you is, how likely is it that Pakistan is going to go along with some of these things? I think the Pakistani leader, General Musharraf, is in a very difficult position. Um, he obviously wants to go along with the United States. Uh, Pakistan has traditionally been an ally of the United States. But you've got to remember that Pakistan, uh, Osama bin Laden, is a very popular man in, in Pakistan. Uh, it's a common first name now for sons, Osama. You see Osama bakeries springing up. Uh, on the street in Pakistan, Osama is a bit of a hit folk hero. So Musharraf has to balance the interests of A, uh, you know, being somewhat accommodating in the United States, but B, the political reality that Osama bin Laden is a rather popular man in his own country. So what that will mean in practice, we don't know yet from the Pakistanis. Does that mean we'll give you airspace? Does that mean we'll allow you to use our country as a staging ground for a ground operation? Airspace. All right, let's talk about st staging. I mean, are there bases already in Pakistan that the U.S. could use if it decided to go after uh, bin Laden and his people in Afghanistan? Uh, there are there are bases. I mean, actually, an interesting historical note. Gary Powers, remember the U-2, the, the, the pilot who was shot down by the Russians in 62, took off from a, a, a base inside Pakistan. So there are plenty of air, air, air bases near the border that one could use. Uh, I just think it's, it's going to be politically very hard for uh, Musharraf to kind of sign on to that. But if he doesn't, uh, he must know there are consequences. I, I, yes, I mean, it's, he's in a very tough spot. But uh, I think that last time we, uh, we sent cruise missile attacks in, in bin Laden's direction, we didn't actually inform the Pakistanis uh, about anything about that plan until the cruise missiles were actually in the air. And a general actually went to the, the, uh, the leadership of the country and said, uh, you're not under attack from India, your traditional arrival. Uh, you're, these are the United States cruise missiles going against bin Laden. Obviously, this time, we're not going to, everybody will be informed. But one last note, Judy, surprise is key to any military operation. We clearly have right. uh, sacrificed that ability at that moment. Bin Laden must be planning some kind of, uh, you know, countervailing measure. Well, that, and I asked you about that when you and I talked about this a, a day or so ago. I said, yeah. every day that goes by when the administration talks about or, or says it's talking about what it plans to do, gives them, whether it's bin Laden or any of the people who support him, time to hide, to go off and make other plans, and makes it all the more harder for us to carry out a retaliation. I'm reminded a little bit of how Pre President Bush's uh, father, who, um, you know, there was, there was, a, there was a, basically this coalition building that's going on. I mean, you sacrifice a prize, but you do build a co coalition if you have enough time, which is obviously what his son is doing now. All right, Peter Bergen, uh, formerly a producer for CNN, now writing a book about Osama bin Laden. Peter, thank you very much. Now our correspondent Eileen O'Connor, who's been following the investigation for the last few days. Eileen, you have some new information. We do, uh, Judy. Uh, so far, law enforcement sources say that they have detained, and the Justice Department has confirmed this, uh, at least 25 people for possible INS violations. Now, this is a way that they can detain some people. Uh, eventually, they will have to perhaps issue dozens more, they say, material witness warrants. And that is another way that they can detain people that they want for questioning. Now, law enforcement sources say they are operating under the assumption that more attacks were planned and either were thwarted or are still a possibility. But they are making rapid headway. Two men were detained in Texas and have been transported to New York for questioning. They may not have been involved, but there are striking coincidences and sources say several reasons they came to the attention of the authorities. Law enforcement sources say Mohammed Jawid Asmath and Ayub Ali Khan both had tickets from Newark to San Antonio, Texas on Tuesday. Their plane was diverted to St. Louis, where they boarded a train for San Antonio. According to sources, they had box cutters. Now, people on the doomed flight said on cell phone calls that the hijackers had box cutters as weapons. What authorities are looking at are, there, are young men and women or relatives in their 20s, Middle Eastern country citizenship, predominantly Saudi Arabian, visas that indicated they were students receiving flight training or are pilots, and who have connections with the dead hijackers that have been identified, like the same or similar last names. Now, several of the hijackers lived here in San Diego. Neighbors say they didn't mingle and sources say they were attending flight schools there. Now neighbors say they kept themselves and to, they kept to themselves and they left in the dark. Uh, the neighbors also said that they were on cell phones and used laptops, uh, and they looked to be uh, laptops with complicated programs. Several law enforcement sources say they had been looking at a man near Boston this summer. In his apartment, they found flight manuals, information on Boeing aircraft, and what appears that he also appears to have been attending flight school. They will not say whether that man is in custody here or overseas. 
Interestingly, my, uh, Judy, the several sources have pointed me to testimony in the trial of the embassy bombing, where people linked to bin Laden talked about members of his organization receiving flight training. FBI Director Robert Mueller admitted, if authorities had looked at this...